you've been listening to this podcast from the start, and especially if you're one of my students, you might by now be beginning to feel as if everything you encounter in the urban environment could be seen as media. Friedrich Kittler, the German media theorist, argued that if the most elementary definition of media is anything that records, transmits, and processes information, then the city itself can be seen as a medium. A medium whose content, to switch gears towards Marshall McLuhan, is just a series of other mediums. This feeling, if you're having it, may be especially pronounced when you observe the architecture surrounding you or happening within the urban environment. If you live in a city which is changing rapidly, construction sites might begin to seem like a process of erasing, copying and pasting, remixing or remediating the city. But it may also be that the new buildings being put in place may themselves have more and more forms of media or communication, such as illumination or interactive screens directly built into their exterior surfaces. The apparent embedding of media forms into architecture has become one of the most prominent themes in recent debates about the relationships of media and cities. While buildings have long been communicative, novel uses of illumination, screen surfaces, and inventive building materials seem to be underscoring a new age where buildings are media. And yet, the interconnections of media and architecture run even deeper than this. Consider, for example, sites whose explicit function is some kind of communication. Museums, art galleries, libraries. Not to mention the buildings inhabited by media industries, sometimes known as media houses. From there, we could observe that architecture is in many ways a discipline which builds spaces for communication in general, both domestic as well as spaces of labor and organization. And, as a discipline, architecture itself is defined by mediation from the age of print to the computational practice it has increasingly become. Where this leaves us is a broad conception, whereby architecture, both as practice and realized design, is both mediated and mediating. The Mediated City is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we rethink media through the city, and the city through media. We will approach the media-urban nexus both old and new, analog and digital, and, most of the time, we'll avoid these kind of categories altogether. Some of you listeners will also be students in my module, Media, Digitalization, and the City, in which we'll discuss and work on some of these themes in more detail. In this episode, the fifth in our series, we explore just some of the numerous intersections of media and architecture. The key idea I want to get across is this. Media architectures can be found most visibly and publicly when media displays and affordances are built into architectural forms. But the relationships of architecture and media run even deeper. They extend to how architecture itself, both as discipline and realized designs, is fundamentally communicative. You're hearing one of the many video walkthroughs of Times Square in New York City, which you can find on YouTube, full of people surrounded by illuminated signs and screens. In some ways, this is a bit of a cliched place for us to start. Times Square is a rather obvious instance of what might be seen as media architecture. It's a site of spectacular urban illumination and signage, recognized around the world alongside similar sites like Piccadilly Circus in London or Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo. But as Scott McGuire points out in his 2016 book Geomedia, Times Square in New York City, and the building at one Times Square specifically, reminds us of the relatively long, if still recent, history of innovations in illuminated dynamic information display being incorporated into buildings. Beginning with election night in 1928, one Times Square hosted a 400-foot zipper, an electronic news bulletin banner. Later, it hosted a Spectacolor programmable animated sign, 
Today, it is covered on three sides by vinyl and illuminated signage, and aside from street-level retail, has no interior tenants. In disregarding interior inhabitation while prioritizing exterior mediation, it is an apt example, says McGuire, of what Paul Virilio calls a media building. Much of Times Square today is made of dynamic screen interfaces, a technology that is increasingly proliferating well beyond this iconic site. We now find screens in the most ordinary shops and restaurants, in minor public squares, built into bus stops and spread throughout metro stations. In some ways, there has been a partial convergence between such screen surfaces and the ambient television we discussed in Episode 3, drawing on the work of Anna McCarthy. As Latan Kraina argues in his 2016 book, Negotiating the Mediated City, while public screens are now pervasive, their sheer variety means they cannot simply be dismissed as indices of living in a media-saturated world. We need to look closely, he says, at the range of ways such screens operate in physical environments, how we relate to them through our embodied practices, and how their disruption or placement is embedded within longer histories of urban spatial management. While public screens are overwhelmingly devoted to dynamic advertising display, their potential for creative or political interventions, as novel ways to promote new forms of public participation in urban life, has excited many scholars, artists, urbanists, and architects. In a similar vein, large-scale public screens have been an object of experimentation by public service broadcasters. In his 2016 book, Geomedia, for instance, McGuire discusses the BBC's now-defunct Big Screen Public Space Broadcasting Project, which, at its peak, instituted large-scale screens in 22 UK cities. The project raised interesting tensions around how a national public broadcaster might intersect with very local city spaces. On one set of metrics, eyeballs, the most popular use of the BBC big screens was for major sporting events, such as football matches. But the relatively short-lived program also raised interesting questions, says McGuire, around how to curate ambient public content for casual passers-by, towards which the BBC mixed its own news content with local filmmakers' work and information programmed by local authorities, and whether such screens might also be a platform for more interactive engagement in public spaces. <laughs> You're hearing tourists taking a video of themselves in front of the CN Tower in Toronto, Canada. They are adjusting the angle of the smartphone camera so that they might capture the tower from bottom to top. For 32 years, the CN Tower was the world's tallest freestanding structure. During that time, it presented itself to its urban surroundings in a way that was austere and stoic. Its sheer height seemed enough. But these tourists are perhaps interested in more than the height. The video is taken at night, and what is being shown is a constantly evolving LED light display built onto the CN Tower's exterior in 2007, the same year it lost its height record to the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. For Dave Colangelo, who uses the CN Tower to introduce his 2019 book, The Building as Screen, the illuminated dimensions of the tower structure embody a new kind of monumental urban media. Buildings and other structures, Colangelo says, have long been sites for mass observation, for rituals, and for ceremonies. But recent developments in building illumination, which draw on both cinema and digital interfaces, have increasingly rendered large buildings such as the CN Tower, the Empire State Building, or the Eiffel Tower into what Colangelo names massive media. Massive in their size and scale, which makes them visible and culturally significant, operating in a way that is akin to other mediums of mass culture, but media in how they host communicative capacities which are increasingly mutable, involving a constantly changing display, often with interactive affordances via social media platforms or other means. What we are seeing, Colangelo says, is buildings in themselves departing from a situation of relative constancy, becoming part of the more ephemeral, ambivalent, and contingent media city arising in the 19th and 20th centuries, beginning with the daily newspaper and continuing through photography, cinema, and television, which we discussed with the help of Scott McGuire's work in our first episode. Colangelo observes that, in certain respects, such large-scale, illuminated, massive media were anticipated by modernist architectural thought. Prominent thinkers of the Bauhaus, as well as the International Congress for Modern Architecture, or CM in French, thought architectural services should become less eternal. They should become more ephemeral, 
or mutable through temporary forms of illumination or progression on building surfaces, particularly at night. Members of CM describe this as a new monumentality. For Colangelo, the question is whether today we are witnessing a new, new monumentality. There already exist plentiful examples in which various established institutions are using projection or other kinds of illumination for large-scale communication. In the 2015 UK general election, for example, the BBC projected voting results onto the facade of its headquarters, Broadcasting House in London, not only for passers-by but as a backdrop for election broadcasts, paired with aerial shots of an illuminated election map laid out on the plaza in front of the building. Meanwhile, across from Parliament, projected onto the London Eye observation wheel was a coloured pie chart. This chart didn't show the election results. Instead, Facebook UK was projecting a breakdown of status updates on its platform, a measurement of which political parties were being most talked about. As it turns out, in this particular competition, the winner was the UK Independence Party, or UKIP. In a 2021 article in the journal Space and Culture, Colangelo asks whether illuminated media architectures might also be used as a means to more explicitly make critical interventions in urban life, towards equity and inclusion. While monumental architectural illumination risks being just another form of commodified spectacle or highly centralized information control, Colangelo suggests that there are other possibilities. In a context of increasingly computational, so-called smart cities, Experiments in illumination just might bring to urban public life, says Colangelo, what Adam Greenfield calls productive friction, or what Shannon Mattern sees as other forms of urban intelligence. We are going live. When we actually do the projection, we have a few people who are helping us out with the physicality of the projectors and moving them around. We have uh, filmmakers and photographers who are doing their job, and then we have uh, people who interact with the public and security. Colangelo gives three interesting examples of how illuminated media architectures might hold potential as critical spatial practice. The first is temporary activist interventions, like the one you've just heard. Robin Bell's provocative projection of words like guilty and felons welcome here onto properties owned by the Trump organization. These kinds of tactical interventions, Colangelo mentions others such as those of the Illuminator Collective, use projection to temporarily disrupt the routine consumer city. On the edifices of global capital might be anti-capitalist or anti-gentrification messages. On government buildings might be protests against racism or xenophobia. His second example is of an intervention he and others made at his own university institution, seeking to repurpose and remodulate the relatively neutral LED light display on one of its buildings. Via social media and other means, the Rye Lights project allowed students and staff to interact, if still in a somewhat constrained way, with the LED display by requesting changes to mark significant events with particular attention to diversity and inclusion. Colangelo's third example is in some ways the most striking, the We Live Here 2017 project in Sydney, Australia. Here, a local public housing activist group, with the help of creative practitioners, installed in partnership with residents hundreds of multicolored LED lighting strips in 234 windows of apartment buildings threatened with demolition, which were lit every night in patterns of the residents' choosing. Even though this remarkable display didn't stop the redevelopment, through social and other media, it attracted global awareness. It showed how, with relatively simple and affordable forms of illumination, urban architecture could be redeployed towards critical public expression. Morning. I thought you weren't coming. Uh, Tim, three minutes of summary, no difficult words. You might recall from episode 2, media historian Aurora Wallace's description of early newspaper buildings in New York City's Park Row. These skyscrapers, situated directly across from New York City Hall, were the city's tallest, and far exceeded the height of church spires. They represented a new kind of urban power and significance vis-a-vis -vis both organized religion and formal city politics. The offices, headquarters, and infrastructural facilities of media companies and institutions have often sought to outwardly project their social, cultural, political, and economic power. 
But such media houses, as Stefan Eriksson and Christina Rigger call it in a 2010 edited book with the same name, do more than this. They are also places that variably crystallize the logic, reflexivity, and culture of the media organizations they host. From their exterior through to their interiors, media houses are another form of media architecture. They are a key means for constructing what Nick Coldry called the myth of the mediated center, the naturalized notion that centralized media, sometimes called the media, are the main clearinghouses through which we access the wider world. We can see this clearly if we return to BBC Broadcasting House, which is discussed by Stefan Eriksson in the 2010 Media House's book, and was also visited in person by students taking the module to which this podcast is paired. One can learn a lot about the BBC's symbolic status in relation to the nation by paying attention to its material spaces in the city. Broadcasting House is the registered headquarters of the BBC and, after a significant renovation and expansion, is the London home of virtually all of the BBC radio and television news services. The building's exterior exhibits a whole series of attempts to present the BBC to its urban surroundings. Numerous locations are engraved in the paving stones, radiating out from the entrance, seemingly invoking the BBC's national and global reach. These locations are interspersed with speakers, which sometimes emit the broadcast of the BBC World Service. A dedicated entrance has been maintained for Radio 1, and now BBC Sounds, mimicking a former location nearby at Yalding House, a specific place at which fans can still gather, cheer, and adore artists arriving for a radio spot. Erickson points out how the facade of the smaller, original 1930s building consecrates the BBC's broadcasting heritage. Statues from Shakespeare's The Tempest, Prospero the Magician and a young, naked Ariel, the spirit of the air, are meant to evoke, in combination, the magical, enchanting, sublime nature of broadcasting. These statues have also been a focal point for controversy. In January 2022, a man climbed onto the building facade and, while an accomplice filmed and commented, spent several hours defacing and chiseling the statues in a protest against their sculptor, Eric Gill, whose diaries show he sexually abused his own daughters. The interior, by contrast, embodies the BBC looking to its convergent digital future. From a ground-floor media cafe, one can take in a spectacular view of the BBC's newsroom a space filled with computers plugged into London's network infrastructures. When it opened, airport-like arrivals and departures boards displayed incoming and outgoing news packages to editors, an input-output apparatus for a global, multi-platform news operation, all at the centre of what John Smith, the BBC's Director of Finance, called in 2000, quote, a huge, highly efficient global broadcasting machine, end quote. Notably, the interior of Broadcasting House also includes designs that in some way reflect office spaces in the so-called creative industries. Many staff no longer have personal desks. Instead, they use hot desks and need to store their personal effects in little locked storage containers. When staff need to chat, they can do so at loungy meeting spots which seemingly take a page from the design books of Google or Facebook. Perhaps this is an attempt to infuse a traditional media institution with flexibilized, even cool atmospheres. A media machine functioning as much on emotions and affects as protocols and digital networks. Not long after 9-11, we were confronted with a dilemma. Uh, and the dilemma was whether we should participate in a competition for the reconstruction of Ground Zero or whether we should participate in a competition for the new headquarters of uh, Central China Television. We actually chose for the Chinese project, uh, and the reason was uh, we knew very well what we were doing. Uh, China is a country that is modernizing. Uh, That means it has on one hand enormous appetite for newness. Uh, On the other hand, uh, it is uncertain, of course, where the modernization will end. Uh, But we felt it was very important for us to participate in a project that could help to define uh, the outcome of Chinese evolution. You're hearing Rem Koolhaas, the renowned Dutch architect and urban theorist. He's discussing how his firm, the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, or OMA, decided to enter the design competition for the new China Central Television headquarters in Beijing. 
ultimately successful, they went on to construct an enormous 473,000 square meter building on an expansive 10 hectare site with enough space to house 100,000 employees working across the network's administration, broadcasting, and production departments. Writing in the 2010 edited book Media Houses, which I mentioned earlier, philosopher Sven Olive Wallenstein discusses the building's highly unusual three dimensional loop design. At the base of the building is a large, partially underground production facility. From either end, two angling towers rise, one dedicated to broadcasting, the other to research and education. And these two towers are reconnected at the top via a cantilevered section that is home to management staff. Throughout the loop runs integrated digital infrastructures intended to shape and modify employee behavior, as well as a pathway which, through continuous glass partitions, visitors can peer into the production spaces while also gaining spectacular views of Beijing. The China Central Television headquarters is perhaps obviously an iconic building. And yet, for Wallenstein, this iconicity operates on many different levels. Most images of the building are from an aerial perspective, which emphasizes its enormous footprint on Beijing's urban landscape. But seen from street perspective, Wallenstein says, the structure is not nearly so dominating or overbearing. It is effectively a collapsed skyscraper. Discourses on the building center on how it embraces openness and communication flows, as well as complexity and engineering excellence. OMA tend to emphasize the former quality when discussing the project in the West and the latter when discussing the project in China. Considered critically, Wallenstein notes, there's no question that this is a site of command and authority, given the central role of its tenant in Chinese media culture. And yet it more so invokes an authority linked with economic growth and innovation rather than party power. Given all these contradictions, it's no surprise that the building featured in Nick Bonner and Dominic Johnson Hill's The Beautiful Future, a series of paintings produced in collaboration with artists from North Korea, showing gleaming modern developments in China, paired with a decidedly party propaganda aesthetic. Wallenstein's overall argument is to draw out what he sees as the allegorical meanings of the China Central Television Building, of which two are worth highlighting here. The first is what it tells us about so-called media houses. The transparent yet segregated pathway running throughout the loop maintains the separation of media production and consumption. It's an allegory around how making visible the mediated center inherently involves constraints to continue to hold it separate. The second is that this extraordinary building crystallizes several strands in Rem Koolhaas's conceptual thinking over many years. That architecture is not simply inert outputs, but a technique for shaping information flows. That buildings shaping such information flows require autonomy and need not necessarily be concerned with their urban surroundings. And finally, a belated recognition that the skyscraper has run out of steam and is no longer a way to break innovative or new architectural ground. Wallenstein's argument covers several senses in which we might conceptualize the links of media and architecture. It takes us from the iconic level, how buildings act externally as media, to the level in which architecture itself integrates media logics. His example happens to be a dedicated media facility, the headquarters of a major broadcaster. But he dedicates as much, if not more, space to discussing the work and writing of Rem Koolhaas, and in so doing, he seems to be interested in how architecture more generally, as discipline and realized designs, is mediated and mediating. You do not have to look very hard to find high-flying architecture, urban design, or urban planning firms variably describing their work as a kind of spatial language. It is common to hear architectural interventions in the built environment invoked, explicitly or implicitly, as a form of writing or scripting the city into a language that can be read. Read first and foremost through first-hand embodied material experience, but also read via circulating images and discourses, which in the case of iconic architecture can also lead to strong associations between buildings and places. This reminds us, too, that architecture itself is inherently mediated. In episode 2, we discussed how the rise of print led to new forms of text-based architectural theory that could be circulated and shared. And architecture today, both as practice and realized designs, is in many respects fundamentally computational. 
A good example of this is the Monument Building, a grade-A office space facing directly onto London's monument to the Great Fire of 1666. The facade facing the Monument Plaza is comprised of a full-height curtain of 69 twisted metal ribbons, meant to give interesting vistas in and out of the offices. But these ribbons could never have been designed using traditional methods. They are the product of complex parametric modeling tools. Wallenstein makes a broader point here, that perhaps architecture only exists through its mediations. Whether we speak of computational modeling, digital visualization, drawings, photographs, written texts, or verbal statements. Reinhold Martin's 2003 book, The Organizational Complex, is a good example of these even broader notions of a media architecture intersection. Martin focuses on how post-war corporate architecture in the United States incorporated contemporaneous ideas in systems thinking, notably cybernetics. Through this, Martin presents a different perspective on modernist architecture, focused less on aesthetics and more so on how architecture is linked with organizational communication. For Martin, architecture was one of a number of novel technologies that supported modern approaches to organization in the post-war period, alongside, for example, mainframe computers, telecommunications, and the automobile. Martin very deliberately uses the term medium to describe modern architecture. A la Marshall McLuhan on television, modern buildings are an environment. The steel frame spaces of modernist offices, Martin says, provided a standardized framework for interchangeable organizational elements, such as curtain partitions and communication technologies. They marked a turn away from buildings constructed around centralized command and control. This is not to say that open plan offices eliminate symbols of status and hierarchy in organizations. In her 2021 book, Open Plan, Jennifer Kaufman Bueller shows how flexible office design transformed rather than replaced organizational hierarchy, producing new kinds of discrimination based on race, social class, and gender. The point for Martin is that modern office architecture embodied a capillary form of power, as discussed by Michel Foucault and later Gilles Deleuze, activated through individuated subjects. One upshot of Martin's account is an argument against a primarily aesthetic assessment of modern office architecture. We should not, Martin seems to be saying, evaluate modernist architecture by critiquing or appreciating exceptional buildings or designers, such as the Seagram Building in New York City or its architect Mies van der Rohe. To do so makes the mistake of overemphasizing modern architecture as buildings judged as individual artworks. Instead, we need to pay attention to modern architecture's medium specificities, which Martin suggests are above all based on modularity, that it is a flexible form of architecture, which can evolve with organization requirements. As Martin puts it, modern office architecture should be watched like network television. Its modularity is akin to, quote, switching architectural channels, end quote. That's it for this episode. In our next, we will be exploring graffiti and other forms of street art as subversive, and sometimes not so subversive, interventions in the urban environment. So, until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to The Mediated City.